All right, Hebrews 5, 1 to 6. Hebrews 5, 1 to 6, on the count of three. One, two, three. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Lord God, thank you for this word. Holy Spirit, we ask you to bring it to life in each one of us, that everyone is quickened, and their minds are ready to be illuminated by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Hebrews 5, 1 to 6, as we just read, it is about being a priest. And you'll notice that it says, for every high priest is chosen from among men, is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. So if I ask you, what is the job of a priest? I would hope you could repeat that. We're talking about the tabernacle and the Old Testament system, the Mosaic laws that was established with the Jewish people. And they didn't come up with this system on their own. God told them, told Moses, this is what you're going to do. He said, make this thing, make this tabernacle. And this portable structure that uh, it has this white linen around the outside representing the righteous deeds of the saints and our purification in Christ. And then inside we go through the bruised and bloodied gate, Jesus Christ. We come to the uh, altar, brazen altar where the sacrifice took place and animals were slaughtered in this courtyard as a sacrifice to the Lord. And they were for sins. They were also thank offerings and different types of offerings. But now you have to remember, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people out here in the Jewish people. And they were all being ministered to through the priests in this courtyard here. So as they were bringing in their offerings to God, which could be grain, it could be wine, it could be oil, it could also be a flower uh, or animals, mostly animals. You're talking about a steady stream of thousands of animals being brought in here to be slaughtered as sacrifices on this altar. As we have identified the altar of sacrifice, ultimately pointing to Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who was ultimately sacrificed finally for all of our sins. But what I want you to see is what is a priest? And we're going we're gonna to look at what a priest is in, in this structure so we get a, a basis when you hear that word. Uh, can you show the, the next um, photo? Technical difficulties. See, they didn't have technical difficulties with the tabernacle. It'd be, they brought the animal in, they slit the throat, they cut it up. This was like a large butchering shop, and I was trying to show you what it might have looked like. So they would have tables. They didn't cut up the animal here on the altar. The priests would slice the animal. They were the butchers. That's exactly what they did. So if you came out here, you would see all of these animals being, <laughs> being slaughtered. It's uh, the picture of the people cutting the meat which would fit in the theme of what we, there we go. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Brian. So this just kind of gives you an idea of what it might have looked like. But these are not butchers, these are priests. These are Levites. And uh, they've got blood all over the place. Is this the idea that you would have had thinking about the tabernacle? So you can imagine coming in here and seeing the flow of blood everywhere. It's a disgusting, it's a holocaust of animals. Alex was in Ireland and these lambs are really cute and one of them fell in love with Alex and his, it's so cute, it was so cute. He'll never eat lamb again. <laughs> he held the lamb and the lamb looked up with him and his big eyelashes. 
and it's almost like they're it's almost like they want to go to sleep right alex in, in your arms so sweet well that's what they were slaughtering here by the way <laughs> and what does this show us this is the cost of sin it's a bloody mess pain and suffering and death and that's what you would see if you went into that courtyard you don't think of a priest as being so practical right you think some guy often floating off in never netherland reciting the bible and wearing the robes well this is what they actually did and um but there was a high priest that was chosen among all the priests and there's two different groups of priests uh in the mosaic system you've got the they're all they're all leave so remember in, in the jews had 12 tribes and one of them was the levites they were descended by levi right he was one of the 12 sons uh, of, of jacob right and they were the ones only from this tribe could you become a priest so you have the levites out here doing all this dirty work and then they would also get chosen to go inside that other chamber that was the holy place and the holy of holies. Holy of holies, that place where the presence of God was, that final curtain, only the high priest once a year could go in. So these guys wouldn't go in unless eventually they were chosen to be the high priest for that year. But these guys couldn't ever be chosen to be a high priest, actually. Because you've got another group that were also of the tribe of Levi, and that is Aaron. Aaron was the brother of Moses. And he was the first high priest that God told uh, Moses to select. So now only the sons of Aaron could become the real the priests. These are Levites. Okay, let me call them Levites. I wouldn't call them priests necessarily. But the, the priests would go into that inner chamber and then they would be the ones who would make the candlestick burn and put the oil there and they'd put out the showbread, the 12 loaves. And then also they would be the ones that would stoke the coals in the uh, altar of incense. And then from that group, the, the high priest would come. All right. Uh, now the high priest would also make intercession. He was going to pray or the priests would pray for the people. And I was reminding you guys in the Bible study today in Luke 1, if you remember the story about Zechariah. And Zechariah was the father of John the Baptist. And you'll remember that he was chosen by lot from all of these other priests to go in twice a day. A priest had to go in and stoke the coals uh, for the altar of incense and also trim the wicks on the burning candles and put oil there. And then, so that's what Zechariah was doing. He went in by lot. He was chosen at random. And he went in and he starts to stoke the coals of the altar of incense. And Gabriel, the angel who stands in the presence of God, shows up right next to him. And all of that representation about incense being the prayers of the saints, of people of God, was demonstrated tangibly by the presence of Gabriel. And while he was in there doing that, the whole people were out in the courtyard it was the temple at that time, not the tabernacle, and they were praying. It was the hour of prayer. So that's what's going on. That's what Zechariah was. But this has been going on for thousands of years, and then Zechariah shows up that day, like they've done thousands of times before. Okay, light the coal, light the thing, you know, da, 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 and then poof, you know, there's the angel. So, uh, but God's saying, look, I'm, I'm making this real to you. This is all representational, but I'm going to make it mean something to you. Um, so that, that's what's going on. Now, the high priest will pray. I used to have a video. It was a very lovely prayer uh, of a contemporary. They don't, I don't, they don't really have a high priest now, but the priest of Jerusalem would, would pray this prayer. And it was from Numbers where he's blessing the people of Israel, right? And uh, he'll sing it. You know, sings it out in Hebrew, and, and it's a blessing over all the people of Israel, and he does it once a year. So that's kind of the magnitude of the prayer that's coming out from the high priest. Um, okay. Now, as they're bringing in the, the, the sacrifices here, the priests are part of the purification process. So now, I just read in Hebrews 5, 
This is New Testament, but it's talking about, because this is their point of reference. When you read the New Testament, once you understand what's going on here, a lot of the mystery is going to be taken out of what you're reading. But they keep calling back to this. And now they're explaining, Paul and Peter and all these guys are explaining what this means to people that are just getting introduced to Jesus. They had lived, the Jews had lived out with this system. That's all they knew. And now Paul is coming along and Jesus is coming along and all of those apostles and they're saying, look, that was ceremonial. That was inferior. But they're going to refer to this so you have something tangible that they can point to that is spiritual. And everything they're trying to get us to see is that this slaughterhouse, this is pointed to Jesus being sacrificed as the lamb. And then we talked about the other components as you go in. And the, the people that are doing this, they're, they're appointed by God once. These, these Levites are identified by birth. God chose Aaron at the beginning, but there is no selection process after this. You're born into it. You, no one can do what they're doing unless they are born from this family. Nobody. They'll die. God will kill them. So um, there's no seminary to go to. <laughs> they don't have a resume. They didn't do good deeds to get that. They're just born into it. This is the Levitical priesthood. This is very different from the Melchizedek, Melchizedek priesthood, which we're going to talk about. Now, these guys were responsible, the priests were responsible, and the Levites, for purifying themselves. Remember, they had a wash in the laver. Well, of course, you're going to have to wash if you've been doing this. If you're handling the results of sin, the blood, the, the slaughter, the filth of sin, you're going to have to be cleaned. And they were responsible to do that. And the Bible says they would die if they didn't wash. You can't press on forward without purifying yourself. All right. Now, inside... Remember, there were 12 loaves of bread on the table of presence. And those were changed weekly by the priests that were. There were subsections of the Levites and subsections of the Aaronic priesthood. And they took turns like on a shift six days a week. One family would have one responsibility at this day and this hour. The next family would do this, and the next family would do this, until you get to the Sabbath day. And on the seventh day, they all took turns on that one day. So it's not like the Smiths are, are being the priests for Monday, the Eurytias are on Tuesday, the Strezeniks on Wednesday. <laughs> Give me an easy name there. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and so, but on, on the Sabbath day, they all took one shift in what they were doing. Okay. Um, and that showbread would be replaced only once a week. And the only people could eat that bread were the priests, except, except if you were David or Jesus or us. There is a story in 1 Samuel about David running from Saul. And David was from the line of, of Judah, right? He's not from the... Aaronic family. He's not from the Levites. Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. He's not from the Levites. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is not, he would not be allowed to do this in the, in the tabernacle. And supposedly, neither was David. Before David was king, he was anointed king, but he wasn't king yet. And he's on the run from Saul. And he and his band of, of bad boys, or good boys, are out and, and running from uh, Saul, the king, and uh, they run out of food. And they go to the tabernacle, the priest there, excuse me, and he, they said, we want the food. That, and he said, well, the only bread I have is the holy bread that's on the table of the presence. So that's only supposed to be for priests. But what happens? The priest gave it to David. And David and his men ate it. The priest first said, have you and your men kept yourselves from women? In other words, are you pure? And David says, yes, we've been fighting on the run from, from Saul. So uh, everybody is pure because back then, if they went into battle, they would abstain from sexual relations. Um, what does this mean? Why would he give it to David? He should have died. David should have been killed for this. 
but it speaks of Jesus. This is a type of Jesus. If you'll remember, Jesus was going with his disciples on the Sabbath through a grain field, and they were pulling off grain and eating it, and he was giving it to his disciples. And the Pharisees said, uh, what are you doing? This is not right. You, you can't do this. And Jesus uh, said, if you knew who were here with you, I am, you know, he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He's above all of these things. And he goes in to tell them that, um, you know, you, you hypocrites, you put religion first, but you don't understand that religion is about the people. It's about the nourishment of people. It's the benefit of people. It's not there just for the tabernacle. We're not here supporting the priesthood. The priesthood is supposed to be servants, and the whole system that's been put in place is supposed to serve the people. This is in Matthew 12. Matthew 12, 1. And at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, not for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Go to verse 11. He said to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man who had a withered hand, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. The priests of this system wanted to kill the work of God through Jesus. They didn't understand grace and love and those things. All they, they knew the process. They knew the institution and the rules and everything that looked religious. And they made that their idol. As opposed to what Jesus was doing, was saying, these things are interesting and they point to something. But what we are concerned about is the healing of a man for the welfare of the children of God. And if that means they need to eat that bread, if it's under the authority of Jesus, they can eat it. You have become a royal priest. You have become a priest through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2.9, 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let's set aside now with Jesus the old religious system. But can we get it out of our own churches? Can we get all of this stuff that was left over with the old religious mindset to think that the priest has to wear a robe, that you have to have stained glass windows, that you have to genuflect, that you have to do this and that? Can we get that out and go back into the grain field? Can we go outside with Jesus? Can we go and have the freedom to eat what God has given to the children of God because you are part of the royal priesthood and it is about your welfare and your salvation and the restoration of your heart and mind that God has created this new system for. You are not a slave to religion. Religion is a slave to you. If you're free in Christ, if the grace and love of Jesus has touched your heart. He has come to lift us up and help us. We don't serve a religion. We have life and faith in a savior. You are a chosen race. He chose Aaron to be the first priest 
All the other guys were just born into it. In your case, individually, he chose you. He chose you before the world began as a royal priesthood. And if you take all of this tangible stuff, we're going to translate that into our service as priests in the real tabernacle of God, which is us. You are priests. This is a temple. If you go to Ephesians 2, and you go down to 18, for through him, Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you know, are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That's why this is a reverential place. Our relationships is what we revere. This is what we have. This is the tabernacle. And Christ is in you. In us together. That's why we don't take our meetings with disrespect. We don't take the communion with disrespect. We don't disrespect the word of God or the prayers or the people of God or the ministers of God. That they would never have desecrated anything in this temple when they were obeying the Lord. They would have killed the person who did. You've got to see this as a holy reference point for us. We are what they're playing around with here. This is the real thing. That's the fake thing. That's the shadow. And the greater thing is in heaven, which we are also a part of. So you can see all the blood. Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. That's, they knew that. They didn't know it was Jesus that this was pointing to. But we know that. The life that we have comes through the blood of Christ. He is our high priest. When that curtain was torn, when he died on the cross, it gave us free access to come in with his blood, to come into the presence of God. But he, and he alone is the high priest, but he's not chosen once a year. And he doesn't just die every, uh, as all those men that were temporarily serving as the high priest, he is eternal. Mm -hmm. And this puts him into a different priest category. He is not part of the Aaronic priesthood. He is not part of the Levites. He's something greater. And the Melchizedek priesthood is greater than the Aaronic priesthood. And again, this is why we learn from the Jewish system, but we don't become Jews. We don't, we don't become religious in the performance of these religious duties like they do. We understand something greater. We learn from them, but we don't want to become them. So don't ever let Judaizers take you back. Mm -hmm. The priest was there to offer sacrifices for his sins. That's why you brought that stuff to him on your behalf. You cannot walk up, cut that animal yourself, and then put it on the altar. You'd be killed. Only the priests can do this. So the priest's job is to take what you're offering, you bring it under the Mosaic system, he kills it, and because he's the go-between between God and you, and he's the one that's helping you rid your sins, you can't do it yourself. You need the priest. Melchizedek system. Different. Genesis 14, 17 to 20. Genesis 
14, 17 to 20. After his return from the defeat of Kedor La Lamur, should have looked that one up, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him, that's Abraham, at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high, and he blessed him, blessed Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abraham, Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered our enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Who's Melchizedek? We don't know. There's no genealogy. He just shows up. And in his title is hidden meaning. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. But the Bible also says he was king of Salem, which is Jerusalem. Salem meaning peace. He's the king of peace. He's the king of righteousness. This is Jesus. And there's some debate over whether that was actually Jesus. or that, But I believe this is Jesus because Abraham comes to him as a priest. Where's the Mosaic system? There's no Mosaic system at that time. There's no tabernacle. This is Abraham. This is before Moses, before all of this. It's just Abraham talking to God. There's some evil king steals some of his people away. And Abraham takes a band of guys, goes out, beats these people, and takes what they stole back, including people, including Lot. And now, as a result of this, Abram wants to show respect to Melchizedek. He goes to Melchizedek as his priest. And what does Melchizedek bring? He does not bring the wine and the bread. Melchizedek provides it. He brings the wine and the bread. Just like our communion. Where does that come from? Jesus. Jesus, at the Last Supper, takes the bread and the wine and he gives it to his disciples. This is a tie that shows that Jesus is of the order of Melchizedek. He is not an Aaronic priest. And this is greater, king of righteousness, king of peace. And then we see, uh, we see that Abram, who is the, the father of faith, all of us, come to Jesus as Abraham. He is giving a tithe. He tithe a tithe is a tenth of whatever he has. He gives it to Melchizedek before this system. The tithe is different. It's eternal. And even Jesus validates that when he, said, when he accuses the Pharisees of being fake Christians. Here it is, Luke eleven thirty-eight. 38. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. Je Jesus didn't wash first. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools! Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give his alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves and people walk over them without knowing it. One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things you insult us also. And he said, Woe to you, lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. He says, give the tithe. But if you do these things without the right heart and you're not there to help, especially if you're a priest or a minister and you're not there to help people get free from their burdens, then you're not a part of Jesus. You've got to do both. 
but you have to help set people free of the bondage. You don't just teach them about religious requirements and laws and doing this and all of these procedures and the ceremonies and the genuflection and everything, you know, and all this other goofy stuff. You didn't wear your crucifix properly. It's not big enough. You've got to have a bigger crucifix. You've got to kiss the priest's hand, the pope's hand. You've got to have a Vatican or you don't have a religion. Outside. It's all outside stuff. And you can come in and do even what we're doing in here. But if it's not in your heart, if you're not doing it for the right reasons, if you don't care about lifting burdens and healing people and loving people and caring for them, then it's all a religious exercise that has no place in the kingdom of God. You clean the outside, but not the inside. Everybody's so worried about how they look on the outside, like the mannequin, what you dress that mannequin in. But what about what's inside? He says, give alms for the things that are inside. In other words, you give to the poor. You give money to the poor offerings to needy causes. And you do that because I'm a Christian. I get to show everybody that I give. I get to wear a T-shirt that says, I like this cause or that cause. I wear a pink, pink ribbon because I care about people that have breast cancer. Now, did you do it because you want people to think you're socially active? that you want to be part of this cool generation that looks after the poor? Or did you do it because you actually love people? Did you do it because God is inside you and you really want to be an instrument of the Lord? You can play this game, but God sees through it. Tithe what's inside, the alms inside. Give your heart, love people, care about them. Love the things of God, for real, don't just play. Greed and wickedness inside, but outside you look good. All your churches look good. Your churches, they have mission trips, right? That's how we prove we're good. You went and you painted an orphanage, but you beat your wife when you got home. You had, you had a little too much to drink every night when you got home, but you painted the orphanage. We got pictures. Elder, Elder Brown doing a good thing on the outside. Melchizedek, Melchizedek's different. He says, I'm giving you the bread. I'm giving you my body. I'm giving you my blood. And he's a priest forever. Isn't that what that said? Not like the other priests. Jesus is forever. You are my son. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest. He didn't apply to seminary school. He didn't put in his resume to be pastor Christ of the, of the church of Jerusalem. He was called. He was ordained by God. God made him the high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. That's, I have given birth to you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever. That's Psalm 110, verse 4. After the order of Melchizedek. A priest forever. He never dies. He's always making intercession for you. The prayers are always going up. The altar of incense is always burning. He's always that sacrifice. The blood covers you, always. You don't have to keep bringing a sacrifice every Sunday. Well, you never did. I was waiting for the goats to start coming in, and I, you disappointed me. I always wanted Brian to cut them up like this out on the table. But. And then I realized we have a new covenant. We don't have to do that. Marriott would have kicked us out. I mean, that would have been a mess, a terrible mess. No, we can have Christ in our hearts. And this sacrifice is made for us. The bread has been given to us. The blood has been given for us. You did not earn it. You did not buy it. And out of gratitude, the tithe comes. Out of submission. Out of appreciation. Now, Jesus, when he did this, when Jesus was showing that he was of the order of Melchizedek in Luke 22... Uh, verse 14, it says, And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Melchizedek. Abraham. 
And then all that time, thousands of years of the Mosaic system where people could never really get close to God. But they were faithful, usually faithful in doing all of this stuff. That's what's going on in our churches today. They're doing all the religious activity with no heart relationship with God. They don't know the high priest Melchizedek. All they have is Aaron. We're not like that. We need a direct relationship at the Last Supper, like John leaning back and resting into the bosom of Jesus. Can we see the picture of the priest there? Thank you. We'll get into this at another time. But this is the high priest. This is what he would wear going into the Holy of Holies. It's ornate. It's lovely. You know what it says up here? Holy unto the Lord. That's the only thing I've got. These are the 12 tribes of Jacob here. And that is what he's representing all the people of Israel before God. Holy unto the Lord. How did he get that? He's born into it, chosen. But he's got to go through that process. He had to go through the sacrifice. The blood was poured out. He had to wash himself in the laver. He had to be cleansed of his sins through the washing of the word. He goes into the holy place. And in the holy place, you've got the showbread, the word of God. You've got the, the candles. You've got the Holy Spirit revealing the word of God. He's past that. He goes to the altar of incense. And from the altar of incense, he takes some incense into the holy of holies along with the blood of the animal sacrifice. And he's all dressed up and he's pristine like this. How did Jesus come to you? He didn't come like this. Now, he's in heaven. I'm sure we have the description of Jesus in Revelation and uh, Book of Daniel. So he's, he's dressed like a king up there and a, and a high priest. But how did he come when he wanted to meet you? How did he come when he wanted to meet the people in Israel when he was alive? He came as a man. He came in the heat of the day and the cold of the winter time, and uh, he was subject to the weather and subject to abuse and subject to physical drain on his body. He was around you when you were sweaty and smelly and all of the lepers and all of those drunkards and the prostitutes and the demonized. The man who was cutting himself with stones at night and crying out, and he was in the tomb with him. He didn't come like this. This is not, this is not military gear to go out into the woods. And <laughs> this is not military ministry gear. This is in the high holy place. But Christ came to you and to me in our dirt and our filth. Then that is what is lacking in the Aaronic system. Where's the love? They got the system and the process and the uniforms and they got all the ceremonies. But there's no one hugging children there like Jesus. Let the little children come to me. And he picked them up in his arms and he hugged them and he loved them and he blessed them. And unless you come to me as one of these little children, you will not be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's his tabernacle. That's his priesthood. That's the Melchizedek priesthood. And he never dies. But this we can't. It, it's too much for us to grasp without Jesus. And if you do this without Jesus, you bring a curse. When you try to be religious without a melted, humble heart in love with Christ, and you go through all of the, you go through, you come here on Sunday, and you do your little prayer, and you, you say, you know, we do the communion, and you do this, and then even on, maybe even on prayer night, you show up and you pray some prayers, but who cares? This is my religious act. When it comes out of your heart, when it's led by the Holy Spirit, when you've humbled yourself and you're truly grateful to our king, our high priest, that's different. When Moses was leading the Jews across the desert and they were complaining as usual, and they were being bitten by fiery serpents, and God had mercy on them. He made a bronze snake and raised it up in Numbers 21.5. Numbers 21.5. 
And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against you, respecting the things of God, respecting the priests of God, respecting the ministers of God. If you don't, we go back to Belshazzar using the golden items from the temple. Irreverence. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. They confessed their sin. Verse 8, And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Good. They obeyed God. They looked at it. They lived. Guess what they did? They began to worship the bronze serpent. If you go into a Catholic church, and we know that Mary, mother of God, is a good woman, selected above all other women. He never said worship her. But now they have statues and they have rosaries and they say, Mother, you know, Mary, full of grace or what are you? He never said do that. When you look at a church or a priest or a robe or any building or any ceremony and you start worshiping that ceremony or that person or that church or that denomination, you have just worshiped the bronze snake in the desert. Where's your Jesus? You're worshiping something that was godly and intended for you, but you have abused it because your heart wasn't right. And you didn't recognize in your heart. You didn't love him. You didn't appreciate him. You didn't really know him. You knew the things about him. And thank God for Hezekiah in 2 Kings 18. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord King Hezekiah, according to all that David his father had done. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah, and he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. What are you giving your offerings to? When you pray, what are you praying to? When you worship, what are you worshiping? Do you know? Is it because everybody else is huddling into the church and they're all doing this and now it's time to sing? Or did God touch you and you say, I was a sinner? He went through that slaughterhouse for me. I know he loves me. I know he's called me. I know that he saves me. And I worship him. And him alone. And everything else. Me. Brian. Abigail. Everybody else is just here to support your relationship with Jesus. It's not to bring worship to ourselves. It's not to bring worship to the church, not to bring worship to the things of God. It is to worship God and God alone and not denominations and not priests and not temples and not any of that. That's God. That's why it was torn down in 79 AD. And Jesus said on the third day, tear this temple down and in three days I will raise it up in him, in him, Jesus and Jesus alone. Tear down these things. Tear down the idols in your heart and your religious mindset. It is an abhorrence to God. The Lord says in Isaiah 1, 11, What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, that we saw those sacrifices, everything we give, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. That's the prayers. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. That's whether you have celebrating Easter or Christmas or this, what we're doing here. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. In other words, I... I can't endure you singing, sinning and having an evil heart, and then you come before me, yes, uh, yes, oh, uh, priest, uh, please bless me, and oh, thank God, everything's, you know, everything's holy here in this place, and look at me, I'm holy, I got my suit on, I did my genuflection. God can't endure that, he hates it. 
Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Just stop playing. Stop fooling yourself. Stop fooling other people. You got a problem? Confess that problem. Seek help from God. Seek help from us. Seek deliverance. Humble yourself. We must humble ourselves. This is a new system. This is the Melchizedek system. Not that old religious system. Forget it. Everything you saw in your temple days when you were a Buddhist, that's alive and well in the Catholic Church and many other churches. Statues and saying stuff you don't even know it is. The, those Buddhist prayers that you didn't even know what the words were. It's like speaking Latin in the Catholic Church. Or you come into a Presbyterian church or a Bible church and you don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> I want to know. I want to know what this is all about. How do I know? I need to know by touching the person that it's about. The woman that came to Jesus when she had a, a blood condition for 12 years that physicians couldn't heal, she didn't go through any kind of religious process. She stretched out her arm and touched the hem of his robe, and she was healed. Why? Because she touched him. She touched the person. She touched Jesus. You have to touch Jesus. Love him. Seek him. And him alone. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you pray. It doesn't matter what you give if you don't love him. He already loves you. Okay, we're done here. Isaiah 57, 14. And it shall be said, build up, build up, prepare the way. Remove every obstruction from my people's way. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly heart, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Verse 20, but the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Coming to church is not going to give you peace. If you're wicked in your heart, if there's evil in your heart, if there's something in there, you've got to repent. You'll never have peace. You're just wasting your time. Tithe your stuff. Pray your prayers. Stand up here and pray. But your heart, your heart does not belong to God. Repent. Repent. Offer yourself from the inside. Admit you're just like me. Admit that you are one of the one of the drunkards or prostitutes or tax collectors that Jesus sat down with and didn't wash his hands before eating. You know, I, I don't want to encourage anybody to drink. We know the dangers of that. Do you know he was drinking wine with those people? Hanging out at the table? This is not an invitation for you guys to go do that. I, he had a reason to do it, okay, for that moment. I, no indication he got drunk. Let's, let's be very clear about that. But in other words, he's with you. Don't fake it. Don't try to be this when you're all screwed up inside and you haven't gone through the labor and you haven't done any of those things. You're a mess. You're walking in. You're not gonna, you can't wear that thing with blood all over you. Let's, let's go back. Stop pretending. And don't, don't worry about your ministry. Your ministry is you. Get, get you together. And then the ministry flows out. Your love flows out. His love flows out. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Exodus 19, 5, 6. Now, therefore, this is going back to the Jewish people. If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So I'm speaking to you, Israel, right now. 